we've just ended the COP27. And uh, I'm sure you've all been following it very closely. So I would like to start with uh, Her Excellency, Dr. Leila Skamp. Would you please tell us what were the main takeaways for you from COP27? ميكروفونات لو سمحتوا ادي نفس الميكروفون هو نفسه اتفضل اوكي ذس سونز رايت اه اول ثانك يو تو يو هابيتات فور مانيج فور اورجانايزنج اند ثانك يو فور ذس كويستشن دكتور ابراهيم ماي مين تيك اويز واز ذات ذير وير تو كونفرسيشنز هابنينج ات ذا سيم تايم وان واز توكينج اباوت جرين بيلدينجز اند ذا اذر واز توكينج اباوت انفورمال سيتلمنتس اند هاوسنج So the one that was talking about green buildings seemed to happen mostly in the formal sector, the ministerial sessions, uh, in the professional building um, sessions and so on. But the other one about housing and affordability and people uh, was the one organized by non-state actors. And it appeared like the two never sat together enough in the same room. So while one was talking about energy intensity uh, of buildings, uh, the emissions that come out of the materials used, so there was the emissions of buildings and the energy intensity, two tracks. The others were talking about land. We need to get land to build. We need to have proximity to our workplaces so that we don't have to uh, emit more by using transport from long distances. And we need to have livelihoods uh, that would allow us to not emit, because most of the informal settlement occupations tended to be polluting and emitting. So my takeaway was that there were two conversations. However, there were some promising things, and that is that now um, many nationally determined contributions, NDCs, Uh, mentioned buildings now, and they've grown from 45% in 2015 to 80% in 21. Uh, also, the number of countries that have building energy codes has risen from 32% in 2015 to 40%. However, all this does not apply to informal settlements. So we're still talking about two worlds. One, where we're trying to be innovative and put in technology and investment and improving this, but another that is totally out of reach of all of this. And it will continue to be so based on what we heard from the speakers who came up before us. Now, not all of these NDCs have been translated into national adaptation plans, because uh, although it's now 80% mention green buildings, and yet only about 30% have translated this into their national adaptation plans. So while the formal conversation launched a very important initiative called SURGE, which includes housing, transport, waste, consumption, water, energy, yet the other informal settlement conversation launched a very important initiative called Roof Over Our Heads. So we're, they're talking, talking about two different things. People are still looking for a roof, while others are looking to improve building materials. However, even in the building materials aspect, the informal settlement the conversation did include, okay, we may be living in tin shacks, but we can still make them green and uh, resilient. There's new language appearing, Uh, such as it's not about green billions, it's about climate, climate resilient design. Th these were architects, uh, formal architects, but they're finally talking about we need to build, especially after the Pakistan floods, we need to build climate resilient, not green buildings. And there was a lot of talk about the ability of communities to to respond to these strategies. So while the people in Pakistan were hit with maybe equal forces like the ones in Florida, the two communities had altogether different capacities to respond. So that, that led to the conversation on loss and damage. And we were very happy that at the end of the conference, they did agree on a loss and damage fund. We still don't know how people hit by floods in Pakistan will be able to access these funds, but definitely it's something that we're looking forward to. Thank you very much, Dr. Laina. 
So uh, the, the fun that came out in the end was really like a, a victory, which was, after a lot of discussions, this finally came out. Before I give the floor to, to, to us here, the way it was decided that each of the speakers would have five minutes in the beginning, and then we would open up uh, a discussion. So since Noha Iktinai, excuse me, Rania will have her, but she's uh, there, well, welcome, welcome Noha. Uh, it's good to have you with us virtually. Would you be able to tell us what uh, you came out with? And what was the main takeaway for you from uh, COP27? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kandari. And uh, I would like just to start by introducing myself and responding uh, to your question as well and say good morning and, and thank you to everyone uh, in the room. Uh, I'm glad to be here with you today as part of the MENA Housing Forum uh, towards adequate, sustainable and affordable housing for all. I am a senior officer as part of the sustainable resources team at ECLE, European Secretariat Office based in Freiburg, Germany. Uh, now responding uh, to your question, uh, Dr. Kandari, which I think is a, is, a, is a very critical question, looking into the nexus between climate change and housing, uh, please allow me to respond to that and uh, by reminding ourselves but with the UN Deputy Secretary General strong remarks of the starting of the COP27, where he noted that the battle for the planet, whether it's going to be won and lost in cities, something that had been brought up previously at the Habitat Agenda, the General High Level Assembly meeting, but it's also brought up a lot in our discussion now speaking about climate change. Now, uh, just also quickly, uh, maybe speaking about what is ECLE and why our, our, our response to these key takeaways is important for those of you who do not know uh, ECLE. ECLE, which is uh, Local Governments for Sustainability, is a global network of more than 2,500 cities of uh, local and regional governments. It was first established in the 1990s as the International Council for Local Environment Initiative, and that's where that abbreviation of the ICLEI comes from, which I think I was Exactly. So that's why I thought it would be a good start to start there. But now speaking about uh, co-op, co-op, despite it kickstarting with a very, very, I would say, strong messages and success, speaking about, you know, uh, the highway to climate hell without our foot still on the acceleration. It did also come up with a very, I would say, set of key uh, or remarkable, I would say, steps and achievements. And on that, I will start with the first one, which is on climate risk governance. In uh, our previous uh, speakers, uh, uh, Mr. Patrick spoke about the element of partnership and how is it important to have this interrelationship between the different organizations, governments, NGOs at all levels and scales. And this is something that we strongly called for, as uh, uh, Dr. Leila Iskander have noted, the surge initiative, as well as uh, Ms. Mrs. Maimuna in her uh, opening remarks. But what I wanted just also to add in here is the success that the co-op have managed to achieve by the establishment of the transitional committee to make recommendations on how to operationalize the Santiago network for loss and damage. And I believe that this was a key milestone because not only speaking about COP27, we always need to look into the way forward and how the implementation and the operationalization of the Glasgow Sharm el-Sheikh work program for COP28 can actually take place. And as we noted, this cannot be achieved without having partnership at the multi-level governance to transform cities to healthier, sustainable, just and inclusive spaces. The second uh, takeaway take from the COP27 is actually associated with climate financing. We have seen new pledges that were made, such as the adaptation fund and uh, the totaling actually of the amount of around 230 uh, US million dollars being set up for adaptation, as well as the G7 Global Shield Financing Facility. All of these come together to catalyze what we call the transformative climate action. Having said that, and unfortunately, speaking about experiences uh, on the pledges that came from the Glasgow uh, Co-op, and now we know that this cannot happen without advancing and directing climate adaptation investments 
our building capacities, capacities for both public and private sector. We cannot do that without accelerating the use of technology. There has been a lot of elements, as Dr. Laila have noted, about innovative building materials, but then without having the capacity to, to and the know-how or have to, uh, how to apply those uh, innovations, how to integrate them into our planning policies and cities uh, resilience strategies, no change can take place. My last and uh, important key takeaway is around climate justice. Uh, a lot have been brought up in this uh, uh, morning session around informality, around access to the urban poor, and this is all strongly associated again uh, with the discussions that took place at the first ever ministerial meeting on urbanization and climate change that took place at the COP 27. This in itself uh, is an achievement, but as also uh, indicating to, the, to the, the differences or let's say the discrepancy between having the national uh, determined contributions and how that is being reflected into national adaptation plans, it means that uh, yes, there is a progress taking place, but without having a strong engagement from the national government in accelerating the subnational climate action when providing the enabling environment for an inclusive participation of all stakeholders within the urban system, we cannot achieve our climate commitments, whether at the national level or the local level. So this also is a very important element if we are to speak about affordability and accessibility for all. Thank you. Yeah, the challenges are plenty. Are you optimistic? I mean, do we have hope? We have to, otherwise we won't be here today. Thank you. I'll move to Rania now, please. What are your main takeaways? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this interesting dialogue, especially after COP. Uh, I'll be a bit more optimistic. So I'll, uh, I will cite a few positive takeaways from the COP negotiations discuss, discussions and also from the outcome document of the COP. One is the adaptation. Adaptation was at the forefront of the discussion, which is very good. And also increasing funding for adaptation was a good step. There remain, of course, a challenge to take this down to the community level and to the local level and to action but it was there, so it was good. The second good thing in my view is the loss and damages because there was finally an agreement which was debatable. I mean, until the very last moment, we were not sure if there will be an agreement on the definition of loss and damages. The poor countries wanted very much and they, they were keen on having a trust fund and uh, mechanisms for funding the losses and damages, and the rich countries did not see it as a priority at all, as a necessity. And there are they, they they said there are mechanisms. So why specify one for loss and damages, but for for if we're talking about climate justice, this is what this was very important. The UN Secretary General put it at the top completely. I would, yeah, yeah, definitely because. Uh, it, it is important enough for the developing for the developed countries and the rich countries to fund action at the to build resilience for the poor countries but it's also another thing as important is to calculate the losses and damages and to compensate for that so that was a very important thing this a third thing was the ndcs now the ndcs will be reported the national uh, determined contributions will be reported on yearly basis not on five years uh, plan and all governments were encouraged um, to to uh, increase their targets for the NDC. Was there anything said for accountability for each country to actually live up to that? Uh, encourage. It, it, it encouraged, encouraged. Yes, strengthened. Yeah. The, there was a really a debate to double and to the, the targets of the NDCs, but it didn't happen. But at least the, mentioned and pushed. the negotiation now and the debate now is increased because we will not reach the 1.50 target set by the Paris, de Paris Declaration if we keep as, as is. So that, that was another positive one. Uh, a third one, youth and, and children. For the first one, we saw 
youth and children engaging in dialogues. And that was good. That was really good because it is their right. And they what were we actually do... part of the arrangements, the yeah, whole exactly, everything. Exactly. What we do today impacts their lives. And it was only fair to bring them in into the discussions. Africa. Again, Africa for the first time was at the forefront and at the core of the discussions, which was good. And they managed to set a couple of maybe trust funds that focuses on uh, building resilience of African cities. Um, in my, so in my view, it was a hot discussion. It was uh, a hot debate between rich and poor. There was a lot of um, uh, feeling of mistrust between rich, rich and, and poor. poor. But at the end of the day, the outcome document came out with a couple of uh, measured. Yeah. I mean, it was OK. Yeah. Thank you so much. And Amanda, we come to you now. What were, in your review, the main, uh... the main takeaways? Um, first, it is really a pleasure to be here with all of you at the first MENA Housing Forum on a pretty much all female panel. So way to go, organizers, for, for getting uh, the, female representation. I like it. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud and excited uh, to be here. Thanks to the uh, regional hub, the work of James and his team, and Habitat Egypt. I'm, I'm really proud and grateful to be here with all of you. So question at hand. Um, I was at COP for the full two weeks, essentially. It was my first COP. And for those who haven't gone, it is pretty wild. Uh, 40, 46,000 40, people, people yeah. <laughs> descending on a resort town in a beautiful place, while there are really tense negotiations occurring at the same time. So Was there it are manageable at all. Mm. Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> it was an incredible learning experience. You know, there are so many important conversations happening at the sidelines incredible innovations, private sector, public sector, civil society coming together to have discussions about the future of our, of our people, of our planet. Um, but the negotiations are sort of inaccessible for civil society or hard to be a part of. So it's difficult. There were multiple conversations, as Leila said. Um, there was a green zone and a blue zone. Green zone, blue zone, you know, lots. And within the blue zone were so many colors. So it's definitely, it's a confu confusing space. But in regards to takeaways, you know, the loss and damage conversation is very significant. Uh, it will drive, it, there will be more loss and damage conversations down the road. We just released Habitat for Humanity's Terwilliger Center for Innovation and Shelter last week, re released a report that found of 46 least developed countries, they're only emitting about 1% of global emissions. And yet that they is aren't. where 69% of deaths have occurred due to climate related events. So that loss and damage is needed. Seems all the countries, the more industrialized and advanced they are, yeah. they emit more. I mean, of course, yes, absolutely. So what became clear to me is that housing is not on the climate agenda at all. And yet I think it has the greatest potential to integrate mitigation and adaptation efforts. So mitigation is reducing carbon emissions at the household level. Um, the built environment takes up about 40% of all carbon emissions. Housing, construction, and use is about 20%, about 17% of carbon emissions. Mitigation has to occur at the household level. But yet, if we're going to be resilient, we also must adapt at the household level. So we have an, housing is an incredible vehicle to achieve these things. Ad adapt to what? what? What is needed to be done? Yeah, great question. It depends. Climate change is impacting communi different communities in different ways. In some places, it's heat. Heat is what is killing people today. Heat is the what we see of climate change's impacts today, and we must address that at the household. And it's level. getting warmer and warmer. Yeah, but what? heat waves. There's work now to name heat waves. You know how we name hurricanes? That's occurring because we must prepare better for heat waves. Um, so it's really about bringing to fore this concept that we in the housing system 
have a role to play and also to make it visible that we have a role to play in the climate conversation. Amanda, the boy about energy in Europe, for example, they're suffering, you said heat. In, in Europe, it's the cold. And I know that in France, for example, the temperature is only to be set at 19. And there are some very old people. How will the rich countries, Europe, I mean, cope as well yeah of course it, it affects all of us it's a issue of the global commons you know we emit in one place and it it affects, it affects everyone the other. yeah exactly uh, this was in general uh, the main takeaways from our panelists on cop what ha this great conference in, uh, in uh, sharm el sheikh of course you would all be welcome to join us in the discussions please um, Dr. Laila, I want to take you on to another part, which is civil society. You worked a lot with women and children in livelihood programs, in informal urban setting, settlements, and in deprived uh, villages in Upper Egypt. What do you find more difficult to work with, the urban settlements or the villages? And uh, what's needed here and what's needed there for housing? Thank you for the question. They're, they each are very different and they have the, their own set of their features. But working with women, since you brought that up, uh, not just I, but everybody that works with uh, housing and women has come to the conclusion, which I'm happy to say I heard at the conference in all settings, is that if you want accurate data, on what to build, how much to build, how, where, et cetera. Talk to women. Talk to women. Talk to women, okay. yes. Uh, so you have the Slum Dwellers International uh, International Network. They have been for years doing enumerations. They count people in informal settlements before they go to the municipalities and local government to design together collaboratively new housing projects. Now, in this conference, I finally heard people in very formal panels say, if you want granular data before you start planning for housing, in a, whether it's villages or informal urban settings, make sure you get the people in the community to count and make sure that those in that group are women, because they kind of see through uh, what others say, because, you know, in my experience here in this country, when we were doing enumerations as government, uh, the number of families swelled overnight from one week to the next. They would call their relatives in Upper Egypt and bring them to stay in the house with them so that when we counted families, instead of one family living in one place, they would suddenly swell to eight. But it was the women who always told us who was really living in that unit and who wasn't. So it's kind of a funny story, but it's also a sad one. But it makes it more challenging for government to get to accurate granular data. So get local communities and women to do the enumeration, the counting. I heard a lot of talk in this con in COP about um, admissions of failure in not including women in that process. So I was very happy to hear that because they said, okay, we went for nature-based solutions. What does that mean? In one uh, panel, there was a Brazilian person speaking. She said, we removed an entire informal settlement to build trees because the general tone of climate conversations is grow trees. So we were growing trees. But why but move them? I mean, why can't they grow trees around? <laughs> <laughs> there was no land important issue. So they were now admitting that it was a bad solution to go blindly behind all these locals of uh, nature-based solutions, but how, where? So you ask the local community and design the solutions with them. Okay, but, uh, but the question between urban and rural, where is it easier to work? If you're talking about massive prob uh, solutions that involve huge numbers of people, urban is much easier. But if you're talking about quicker implementation, definitely it's rural because the complexity of installing water and sanitation or bringing power closer, it's Next much season. easier to do it in rural, yeah. Dr. Noah, more talk about disaster risk management resilience. You've already worked with that as a senior urban specialist with the World Bank. What were the lessons to take from that? 
Okay, so working with the World Bank on yes. uh, disaster risk management and resilience. Um, I believe here that that uh, maybe to start with with the understanding, I believe of of what do we mean by resilience in such context when we speak about climate change and uh, the housing uh, crisis itself, and and how can that actually be translated into actions? Because a lot of the the initiatives that we see are more of I would say have this non monetary benefits like reducing risk for the population or maybe protecting cultural valuable elements like historical buildings. But when if we are coming really into the bottom of it and try to look into investments of those initiatives, you will see always that it requires a lot of upfront, upfront costs. And this is a very, I would say, critical uh, challenge when it comes into investments in climate adaptation. Because usually with large upfront costs of the public good nature on investments, there is always a very, very limited window for incentives for the private sector, making investments in resilience housing challenging and even making also the quantification of long term financial co benefits uh, lower and lower. So initiatives like, for example, lowering energy costs or tackling issues around energy poverty moves from uh, being a, an, a critical, I would say, or a priority for governments into a second or a third element that is usually invested into it by INGOs or international bodies rather than, than being funded as part of the government's uh, local and national uh, strategies. I think another also element uh, that is also important to understand here that the urban resilience when it comes into being defined from an economic perspective, we need to look into the economic terms of the ability of the urban system as whole as Mr Jonathan have stated in his uh, very early remarks. That when we speak about housing, we cannot speak about housing alone. We need to speak also about neighborhoods. We need to be, speak about how cities are planned. So that entire system of the urban area, we cannot look into adaptation projects as silos anymore and just invest into them. So this predictable performance of the entire urban system when it comes into disaster preparedness and disaster management, we need to look into the utility elements. We need to look into elements of how people in post disaster are actually going back into their jobs, how are they actually accessing affordable housing, what do we mean by affordability, is this just the cost of the housing living, or is it actually the cost of transportation and mobility. So these are all very critical elements to be considered when speaking about the nexus between climate change and the housing crisis. Thank you. Dr. Rania, you're the UN Habitat Country Program Coordinator here in Director in Egypt. What are the main achievements and what are the main challenges here? Um, when speaking to climate re resilience, of course, and, and housing. I mean, achievements, I can cite a few without going into details um, with regards to housing in general. Um, you know, the fact that we are able to work with the government to have uh, a housing strategy that is, uh, that, uh, that, that uses and that uh, depends and, and really looks and is very much aligned with the global housing strategy principles and human rights based. Um, issue, uh, there are other elements that relate to planning and design of cities and how, you know, the process should look into uh, climate resilience as much as possible. Are you working closely with the government? Yes, we are Under working closely with the government with a number of projects, yeah. Especially when it comes to um, policy drafting policies. This is the stakeholder that you have to work with. We also work with local authorities on a number of uh, resilient, building resilience of the of the governorates and local communities with reg re regards to uh, climate change and climate adaptation. So uh, these are a number of challenges are a lot. I mean, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, if we speak about challenges, uh, one of the most, I mean, climate financing, get help the government um, uh, uh, 
build their capacities to apply to the different types of cl climate finances. Financing mechanism is a, is a big challenge. It's not clear. It is very complicated and complex for uh, developing countries and local authorities. So that is really one of the challenges that we face in our work on uh, climate resilience and building climate resilience issues. Data data and information at the local level it's not always there so and when we when we work on building resilience we need to know the local context we really as dr leila said you know sometimes you take decisions on initiatives and interventions that are not aligned with the local needs so getting the relevant people and the right representation in the dialogue in the analysis and the decision making is an important one and data is an issue in general in Egypt and in developing countries so that's that's another one um uh, deciding on uh, people centered uh, initiatives rather than looking at you know supporting government at the central level or abstract or uh, big corporates is another challenge how how to bring down the support and the initiatives and in and and the activities down to supporting communities that are at stake and most vulnerable before i ask amanda i want to ask you all to prepare yourselves please we need you to talk to us so if you have any questions with regards to cop 27 with regards to what you're doing on the ground please get ready to we'll keep the microphones coming to you Amanda, you, you, as Director of Global Affairs and Advocacy for Habitat for Humanity International, how do you go about influencing international development policy with the U.S. government? How does it work? How does it work? It's a good question. Well, we engage, Habitat for Humanity International engages in the issue of influence, advocacy, and policy change. We do this at the global level, meaning that we look at international agreements, so basically UN policy opportunities. We look at different foreign governments. So for example, the US government, and we look at it, this all through the lens of housing and taking a people-centered approach. So the target population we seek to serve, what do they need in order to achieve adequate and affordable housing? In the context of climate change, well, let me go back a step. I think everyone in this room recognizes the potential for transformational impact through housing. When you invest in housing, you're investing in health, education, livelihoods, GDP. We recognize that. It's kind of an easy sell when you have a safe place to go home at the end of the night. You'll have outcomes in other parts of your lives that have improved. That is actually kind of hard to sell when it comes to foreign assistance. Donors don't always want to invest in their development programming internationally in four walls and a roof. They'd rather invest in a water point that impacts 15 to 20,000 people. So making the case for housing as a, a holistic part of the it has development to be so solution. Holistic. <laughs> yes, That's exactly. It has to be so holistic. No, I agree completely with what you were saying. Um, but as I said in my initial remarks, Housing is where mitigation and adaptation come together. And it is the case that must be made that this is a platform for achieving those ends and empowering individuals through the ways in which they build their houses. How does most of the world build their home? Incrementally, we must encourage uh, adaptation and mitigation through that incremental process. And that message has to be made clear to the global donors trying to have development impact. I guess the global donors and in every country around to the governments it, themselves as well, it has to be sold. How many of you have found difficulty in making housing a priority? May I know? Just by raising the hands. How many of you have found difficult? Uh, um, how do you sell it? How do you go about selling the importance of housing? Amanda just told us that housing is really everything together. It has to be sold as a, as a package. It's a house, it's a home, it's security, it's water, it's education. The impact of a human being 
being moved from one area into a more comfortable zone definitely affects the children, affects the growth, affects everything in life. You have to really believe in that to be able to sell the package. So I'm just saying, can you give us examples from the field, from Jordan, from any country that you are here? What have you done to build homes for the needy in your environment? Anyone, please. Hold on. Uh, thank you, Mudassar Khan from Pakistan. Um, I will not talk about the floods at this time, but I'll just give you an example in terms of selling that why housing is important and particularly affordable housing or low-cost housing. Uh, the selling part not just comes from that it is a political, uh, politically important to show that you have, uh, you are providing roof over people's heads. Uh, apart from that, that it impacts in terms of various studies globally which have been done, uh, it impacts about 70 different industries, right, which come into play when you actually get 70 into different industries. 70 different industries uh, do get into play when you actually are doing construction for housing, right? So uh, apart from, you know, you can include uh, cement and uh, steel and wood and um, uh, electricity, you know, uh, wiring and glass. And, you know, so there's about 70 different uh 40 directly and about 30 additional indirectly allied industries come into play. So that's a huge benefit to sell to the government in terms of getting that economic activity going, the impact that comes more to jobs, the GDP, more, more jobs, more growth in terms of GDP, more tax revenue, and all that comes into play. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Anybody else, please? Good morning, everyone. Uh, Munya Tagma, I'm a housing policy consultant. Unfortunately, Where from? I'm from Morocco. Uh, I was going to say that um, that's maybe a silver lining, but I wouldn't want to call it that way. During COVID, it was a lot easier to sell housing because then we realized how important it was and how, uh, how it was a development topic, in fact. So when we were told to stay in our homes and we didn't have homes or when we didn't have proper homes to stay in, uh, it, it, the effects of housing were, were evident. Uh, when we, the density within homes was too high for people to isolate when they were uh, affected, when people didn't have water within their homes to, to wash and, and follow all the, all the, the instructions, uh, preventative instructions, and so on and so on. When you didn't have internet, when students couldn't study from their homes, when people couldn't work from their homes, all of that, I think, contributed to, to showing how important housing uh, is to develop. That's a wonderful example, really. It's a wonderful example because we all lived it. I mean, we all lived it. I mean, you had to be at home. And I know so many family problems occurred from having to be cooped up in the same house and not having space and, and all that. And, of course, to keep away from each other, keep sufficient space. It's a wonderful example you gave us, really. Unfortunately, memories are too short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Thank true. Thank you. But that's when people started realizing how important homes are, and it worked. So sometimes a disaster could give us a benefit in another uh, situation. Anybody else would like to contribute anything? Rania, do you have anything? Any from the podium? Fadal? Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Mohammed Abu Samra. I'm an urban development expert from uh, Egypt. Um, what I want, uh, I want to talk about two things. Uh, first thing is about um, uh, a question to the government. Do we really have to build for the poor people or to enable them to build themselves? Uh, and, uh, but, but the role of government in this case should be uh, turned into technical support, maybe quality control, providing the environment for, for them, the good environment for them to enable them. Can I ask a question there? How yeah. do you expect them to build for themselves? I mean, they built already them for themselves in informal areas. So, so in informal areas. Yes. Uh, what what they needed, it's not the the building, the building. itself, but it is to provide the technical Space support. How to building. yes, spaces and the right. Um, uh, norms for building. I mean, uh, so the role of the government is not to build for them, but to enable, enable. them, enable them to build in a proper way. This is uh, my first question. Uh, so, 
uh, that's number one. Number two, I'm talking about the effect of urbanization on uh, the climate change. Uh, I mean, urban areas definitely um, contributes more to uh, climate change to, to, in, in, in a bad way. So how can we prevent this um, besides making these preventive uh, actions in, in poorer communities? Uh, I mean, richer communities should take part, uh, should take part of our attention in, in how to um, uh, mitigate the, the, the actions, the, the effects of uh, urbanization on the climate change. Thank you very much. I guess uh, if anybody wants to respond to that, but I would just like to say that this is really happening here in Egypt to a frightening extent. I mean, with the overpopulation that we're having, we have increased population. We have 2 million every year, 8 million every four years, like a whole country comes up within four years. How can we build for them? How can we have homes? How can we have schools? How can we have food? How can we have all these things in such a, such a short period? Urbanization is really becoming a problem because everybody is leaving the rural areas and moving into the cities and they're living in slum areas. And instead of being able to cope with that, it's just getting more and more. Okay. It's not that I will respond. I'm not government, of course, but I can... Uh comment. Uh, I do agree with uh, Mohammed Abu Samra that we have to learn from uh, the informal areas and what's happening there. It does respond to a need and that is why it is widespread and that's why it's happening so fast in the case of Egypt, for example, because the people know exactly what, what they want and they build their homes and their community, their habitat accordingly. So we have to learn from that. From from how from how they do it, and what are the the needs and uh, the principles they they build their their homes and their habitat with. Of course, we're not talking buildings. We're talking about integrated community that responds to needs through services, accessibility, and other. So these are elements that we need to consider when we're talking about building homes or houses for for people uh, that's from one end urbanization i uh, yeah it is true that urbanization and the urban cities are uh, the main uh, producers of uh, carbon dioxide but also they are, they get affected by the climate uh, by the climate change and in my view urbanization is not a challenge as much as it is an opportunity if planned and managed well. Honestly, if urbanization, it's a process. So if we plan our urban context, our cities well, and if we manage them well, with urbanization, there, there are wealth creation. I mean, wealth gets created with the urban process. But so, management is absolutely necessary or else exactly. it becomes completely chaotic. Exactly. That's why we say if planned well, if managed well, if we have, if we have the proper tools to capture the wealth that is being produced by the urban process, it could be an opportunity. In this case, we also have to have a lot of studies to find out why the people are moving so much from rural areas to unemployment, lack of work opportunities, things like that are happening there and it's making everybody uh, move. So we have to know how much this, how many of them will come? How can we be ready to cope with all that's happening? Management, as you say, is very important, but with the right studies to, to enable us to face the problem. Yes, of course, I do agree. And I, maybe I let uh, one of my, I don't want to uh, <laughs> you know, take the, the, the microphone too much. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I The question about the enabling environment is really important. Um, it's something that Habitat for Humanity in my work we've been confronting and, and within our organization been confronting how do we enable change that is systemic, that's addressing the barriers that individuals are encountering when, they are when they're when they moving to an urban area and unable to access something that is adequate or affordable and therefore the only solution is to move into an inadequate or even still unaffordable location. Um, we will be launching a global advocacy campaign next year uh, that focuses on increasing equitable access to adequate housing for people in informal settlements to try and address the barriers in each context. It's going to be a global campaign. 
um, really focused on empowered participation, tenure, security, basic services, and climate resilience. Looking at the ultimately, those are the barriers that people encounter when they're when they're really uh, kind of stuck living in a situation that is inadequate. It's going to be very complement uh, complement the roof over our heads campaign with Slum Dwellers International, who we are also engaging with and is an incredibly valuable partner as they mobilize. Who are the valuable partners? Slum Dwellers International, which Dr. Leila had mentioned earlier. Uh, they also launched their campaign. Um, but the enabling environment is a big question. Uh, the research is required in order to, as you mentioned, Dr. Ibrahim, about uh, developing those policy recommendations and working with communities to identify what their specific barriers are. So it's a focus of our work. Hopefully we can we can join hands in that in some way. And actually, with regards to that, there was someone in the earlier discussions who mentioned what happened in Zabalin when they found animals living with the people in the same area. And they thought that the best for them would be to have two stories. So that's enabling them to understand you need to go to them to talk, to advocate, and to and let them see that this is better for them because they're so used to a certain way of life. And animals are an absolute necessity for them. So how do you go about giving them the best within their own needs, which is not always easy? Anybody else, please? Sabah al-khair a jamia. I am Ashraf Aid, and I am National Director of Habitat for Humanity in Egypt. My question is really a question. Maybe it will be for Dr. Layla and Dr. Rania. Also, I mean, in the discussions, in the COP, I mean, we have been following a little bit, especially in the case of, for example, the meetings that are. مصر اشتركت فيها او يمكن قامت بها الحكومه المصريه زي مثلا السستينبل سيتي سيتيز الاينس والحاجات اللي المبادرات دي يعني المبادرات دي لما بندخل شويه في تفاصيلها بتدي وكان احنا بننشئ مجتمعات جديده واحنا بنعمل كده فعلا بس ماذا عن المجتمعات الحاليه اللي موجوده يعني لو احنا بنتكلم على مناطق غير مخططة مناطق عشوائية ودية يعني مش عايزين نقول النسب بتاعتها قد إيه يعني لأن تختلف ناس كتيرة في النسب بس اللي ما حدش بيختلف فيها نسبة كبيرة من السكان في مصر عايشين في المناطق دي فهل في كانت أي مناقشات أو مبادرات أو لو في عند حضراتكم برضو ريفليكشن من المؤتمر عن سياسات معينة لازم إحنا حتى كمجتمع مدني نحاول إن إحنا يعني نساعد شويه في رفع الوعي بخصوص السياسات دي اللي لازم تتبع للمناطق الحاليه اللي موجوده بالفعل يعني شكرا ثانك يو اشرف اشرف واز سينج وير ذير اني انيشيتيفز هي واز فولوينج ذا ايجيبشن سايد ديورينج كوب 27 اند هي واز اسكينج دكتور ليلى اند دكتور رانيا I can, was anything specific. Sorry, very briefly. I can talk about the surge initiative. Maybe you refer to the surge initiative. The surge initiative does not talk about new cities at all. It does talk about existing cities and how we ensure that they are sustainable and they, they reflect cities of the future by looking into five main aspects that Dr. Laila cited, water, energy, inter governance, and so on. So no, the national initiatives, at least the one that we contributed to, uh, which is the surge one, does not talk about new cities. I, I, and the whole the, the dialogue over the, the initiative and the document is how to work on the existing cities uh, with interventions to ensure they respond to and to build their uh, resilience and they respond to uh, climate issues of the future. Uh, having been in government and having come from civil society, I can tell you that we really need to support government. It's not about supporting communities because participatory is not in the DNA of government anywhere. So we need to support governments to listen to communities. That's what intermediaries like you people can do. I remember um, my last decision before I left office was, and, and it was approved by cabinet, mind you, was for Manchit Nasser, one million people, was for in situ 
upgrading. Nobody was going to be moved to Asmarat or anywhere else. And that was based on the people saying, we have money and we have the wherewithal to plan with you. But in order for you to take that one step further into implementation, the participatory thing needs to continue. So it can be done. I want to tell you what I heard in COP that encourages me a little. There was a lot of talk about we must change the people who currently work in local government. We have to place urban planners, architects, community development experts, practitioners, lawyers, women, and so on. There is agreement that the people we hire in local government will never get us to where we need to get to do that uh, in situ upgrading. And the other was our students in universities the curriculum is so outdated in our schools of architecture, engineering, urban planning, that we need to just dump all of these, the content and bring up a new uh, caliber that can then be placed in local government or wherever. The tone is still not for true participatory planning of upgrading urban slums. But let me tell you, in response to your question, Dr. Rahim, people don't move from villages to cities in search of housing. It is in search of livelihoods. So if you want to keep them there, do something about their livelihoods in rural areas. But what that means is that when they come up to cities, they're very clever. They plan to build so that they can enterprise where they live. It, yes, it's going to cause horrendous problems in terms of infrastructure needs and pollution and blah, blah, blah. Uh, because, I mean, even now the Zabalin are complaining from each other. The plastic they are granulating is emitting fumes that cause cancer. So they themselves are bickering about your enterprises have now become too big. It's not just about lower level and up level. It's about now they're demanding to move to industrial zones. People are intelligent, proactive. We need to support government to listen to them. Need to support governments to listen to them. Okay, no, please, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. No, actually, I, I was enjoying uh, the conversation. It's really interesting to Very see interesting. how, yeah, the different perceptions that are coming uh, from the floor and actually also the remarks uh, from our, our panelists. But actually, there are two, two points that really strike my interest. The first one is, do we actually build for the poor or do we enable them? And now also with the, with the point that, that Dr. Uh, Leila have noted about supporting the government to understand how that process happens. I think uh, there's a very, very interesting example that I would love to share here, which comes from a project that we are currently uh, working on. It's an existing project that took place in Rotterdam. It's called uh, the BOTU, Resilient BOTU 2028. And that program is actually, uh, is, is basically an, a neighborhood upgrading program that have used energy transition as an entry point for social equity. And here when I speak about social equity, just to understand the context of that, that uh, neighborhood, or it's actually a district that is, is uh, the program is named after two districts. It's called the Bosbolder Desecron, which is located into the, in the west of, of Rotterdam city center. Uh, these uh, two districts is actually with a population of around 14,000 residents and both districts has a very high density of a population with a very high degree of diversity among their residents, very high levels of poverty that are con were considered around, I would say, the 2018 social index for the Netherlands as one of the poorest neighbourhoods. So with that context and complexity of that neighborhood, and if, if you may allow me to share my slide, in particular, the last slide that I have, slide number five, on that slide, what that uh, program is showing is that within that complexity of, of what is going on within that neighborhood, employment opportunities that for people and building capacities around uh, educating them of how to install solar panels, how to actually build up car charging stations, how to engage women uh, in the upgrading of schools and public areas being redesigned and developing it in a more, I would say, 
climate adaptive uh, conditions, it actually have managed to build up social cohesion within a community that also might have one of the highest level of migrants. So this basically is, is, is what I'm trying to address here is that adaptation initiatives and innovations that we are trying to integrate, speaking about it in COP27 and today, can be an entry point to actually uh, build the capacities of the community, enhance the engagement of the national government. And, and that, that, that I think also the very important element here that usually due to the lack of, of funding and actually how the mechanism of the projects of upgrading are taking place, that unfortunately it ends up within one neighborhood. It does not upscale into the city level. So the level of impact of such initiatives gets to be very small or might be diminishing by in a certain period of time. So what we are trying to do now as ECLE, also working with a number of partners as Resilient City Networks, that we are trying actually to upgrade that uh, BOTO program that is already in the Rotterdam, but into other neighborhoods and other 10 case studies within Europe. And how do we actually do that? We do that by five key steps. The first step is actually looking into what type of policies that needs to be uh, developed or maybe adjusted in order to support, to support these initiatives. So then the first element is updating policies. We cannot always uh, think about codes and regulations that has been developed five or 10 years ago. If we are speaking about climate change and the speed of climate change, then also that has to be updated. The second uh, uh, key element is upskilling, building capacities. The third one is upgrading. So we're looking into solutions, but very importantly, again, with innovation, that without developing prototypes for those solutions and testing them in order to quantify results and see the impact of it from a qualitative perspective as well, we cannot uh, have it for granted that these innovations are going to be successful. The third element, which uh, sorry, the fourth element, which is upscaling. So as I mentioned earlier, achieving a citywide impact, not only a siloed one neighborhood project and the last one which is up uptaking and that's where the engagement at the national level the local level but also what we're trying to do is the engagement at the level of the uh, eu mission for uh, climate adaptation across uh, the european region so i just wanted to share this this example responding to the to the very interesting uh, points that has been raised thank you thank you dr Mirah. thank you from the floor yes please Uh, sorry. Um, the mic. I thought, all right. If you have, if you have the mic, and then we'll come to you. It's all right. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so, um, my name is Eva Khalil. Uh, I'm uh, from Cairo University, and uh, thank you very much for the discussion that has been uh, developed now. Uh, I just have a couple of comments, bringing back the discussion to the climate change and the housing. What are the interrelationships? So, we. Um, I've been working in. Um, um, report about the assessment report in climate change for cities with the UCERN uh, network and we're looking at equity and how this affects uh, climate change all over the world so we we try to learn from what's going on in the informal areas or what's going on in different parts of the world we have the public uh, programs kind of what the top down uh, initiatives that are taken by the public sector and also what we can call the private interventions what people are actually doing now to cope with climate change. And there is a difference between coping, adaptation, and mitigation. And we don't want people to stay as just coping, trying to just, I mean, stay uh, at, um, uh, at responding to climate change, but rather to move up, um, in this uh, agenda. And we see that a lot, a very little documentation takes place of what is are the private, active, or private, private actions and uh, I think this is one of the things to learn from what's going on. Before. So what are the observations if we yes. don't have? Them? So we can see like the people are uh, having more um, uh, response to heat waves and uh, installing, for instance, more um, shading and also for other parts where there are hurricanes. So they how they are uh, uh, protecting their houses from flooding, uh, from river floods, from uh, flash floods, from rain and so forth. So these things, how can we take them forward into more um, can you say consolidated actions? And the second uh, comment I want to have is how we should try to mainstream climate resilience into the planning process. So 
up till now, we have two different agendas. We have the urban planning processes with everything going on, and then we have the climate change agenda. Separate. And so they need to be mainstream it? together because um, even the TOR of whatever uh, settlements that we have currently, it, climate change is not there. And if we try to bring climate change, uh, as uh, what happened in some projects by the GIZ, for instance, then you don't have the experts to take this. So you need capacity building of the experts. So the teaching, the learning at the university level to have people who can do this and then mainstreaming it into the planning process from the expert sides, as well as from the municipality who will be taking these plans into implementation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very, very informative. مساء الخير انا دكتور احمد عبد الوهاب السمان انا اسمحوا لي بس هتكلم باللغه العربيه السؤال ليا فمعلش لو حسب حرج لباقي الحضور انا سؤالي للدكتوره ليلى واسمع عنها يعني كتير وباقي الحضور الحكومه المصريه بتقوم بجهد عظيم والريسيسي بيقوم بجهد رائع في مجال المدن الجديده اللي هي بتتبني حاليا بس المشكله الاساسيه ان المدن دي خلقت كيانات شركات عملاقة ذات قوائم كبيرة رأس مال كبير في نفس الوقت احنا عندنا صعوبة يا دكتورة ليلى صعوبة في الحصول على الأرض يعني مفيش تسهيل للحصول على الأرض الصحراوية وفي نفس الوقت مفيش سهولة حصول ان كل منزل يبقى فيه مهندس مدني انا انا في اعتقادي ان احنا لو حنمكن المجتمع من ان هو يبني منازل بعيدا لان اغلب الحكومات هي بتنظم ريجوليشن يعني بتنظم العمليه البنائيه وليس ان هي تبقى انفولفت ومتداخله في الموضوع. انا سؤالي هل هل من الممكن ان مؤسسات الامم المتحده سواء كانت يو ان هابيتايت او او اي ما كانت تضع دليل دليل لكل الدول تسهيل الحصول على الارض. لأن أغلب مش في مصر بس هي المشكلة في كل دول العالم يعني هتلاقيها في المغرب هتلاقيها في السعودية كلنا نتذكر سنبل بعد المليون لما راح ياخد أرض المعاناة عشان ده يحصل ده. على الأرض حصل إيه وفي الآخر خالص بعد ما خد الأرض وفوجئ بأن ناس تانية عليها نزاعات تانية فإحنا عندنا مشكلة الولوج أو الوصول أن أنت تقدر تاخد الأرض لو أنت خدت الأرض دي هتبقى يعني في متناول اغلب المصريين ان هم يقدروا يبنوا منازلهم ونفس القصه برضو تسهيل كليات الهندسه، كليات الهندسه احنا عندنا عقده في مصر كليات قمه، ايه كليات قمه؟ هو لو تسهلت الامور بقت زي الحقوق او 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 بقت مجموع قليل ده هيسهل ان الناس يبقى في انشاءات لان هو الكي بيرسون هو كليات الهندسه انا في اعتقادي فهل ممكن يا دكتوره ليلى ممكن المؤسسات تضع وممكن مصر يعني مثلا تاخذ المبادره وتضع دليل موحد لهذا في هذه الافكار يعني هل ممكن حاجه زي كده ولا صعبه التنفيذ شكرا بيفور دكتور ليلى انسرز اي جاست وونت تو سي ذات ذيس كويستشن وي سينج ان ايجيبت ذير ار ماني ماني بيلدينج سيتيز بينج بيلد بيج هيوج سيتيز ان علمين فيري نير تو كايرو هير اند هي سيز in are there any rules or regulations that are set in any countries in the world which would enable people to 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 have the land to build themselves rather than the governments building all these cities on their own but then I wish the answer were as simple as a Dalil uh, guide and I will let Rania talk about uh, the ability to work with government to issue that guide there is there are experiments in Egypt where the government gave people land come to Minya and see the buildings that were constructed under the Ibn Baytek program they're all abandoned the people did go they got the land excellent terms and they were given the designs and the infrastructure was put in it wasn't the desert which is now like Minya Gdida, not, not so much inaccessible, but the idea is that people need to live near where they work. It's a complex issue. It's not just about land and a house. If we are going to look at the economic base of what made people in this country build on agricultural land and destroy our uh, agricultural base, they wanted to have easy transport to wherever they were going to their farms or businesses. It's about an, a new economic, industrial, agro, mineral base somewhere where people will go and say, now give me the land. It's not the reverse. Give them the land and help them build because we've seen that that doesn't work. The other thing is that when the government builds for people um, in, in formal neighborhoods, they do give 
concessional loans, يعني في اللي هو the housing or mortgage finance, and they try, but still the gap is so huge. It costs thirty thousand pounds to build in Manchet Nasser, or at least it did, and it is three hundred to seven hundred thousand to buy a Qtasadi unit in one of the new neighborhoods with proper infrastructure. But people who are in dire need of a roof near where the enterprise uh, are not going to wait until they go to mortgage finance or save the money. So it's a complex issue, and it's not just about building a house and availing the land. I will let Rania talk. Uh, I, I totally agree with Dr. Leila. It's not, it's about building integrated communities with accessibility services and so on. Uh, we have experiences, at, at Dr., as Dr. Leila said, in Egypt with Ibn Baytak, where, uh, a couple of other, where the government in new communities gave the land and asked people to build their own building and didn't really work. I'm not, I will not be able to evaluate the success of the, of the experience because if I were to really say it succeeded or not, I need to study it further and get, have much more in-depth information and uh, also interviews with different uh, stakeholders. The, the one thing that I want to um, say is we, we are trying to discuss the issue with the government and um, they respond by saying we built for the most needy by uh, uh, through the social housing program, which honestly, in my opinion, has has improved recently in terms of uh, in terms of um, implementation and uh, accessibility and also choices of where the the social housing program should be uh, creating, as I said, integrated communities with services, markets, and so on. It has it did improve lately. But the problem is they do this in new communities because of the problem of the land ownership. And this is a complex issue in, in Egypt. It relates also to you know, the cities and the expansion of the cities. Where will they get you know, uh, uh, areas to, to put, to include it in the urban context and build on it? Most of our cities are really struggling with this concept. So it is an, a complex issue. Uh, when we talk about people who are not able, you know, to access the social housing program, because as some say, it is even it is not it is not uh, accessible to most of them, and most and a number cannot cannot afford. They say then this is a social uh, ministry of social solidarity issue that it, they, the the ministry of social solidarity can come in here and see with us. How can we solve that issue? They, from a housing perspective, Ministry of Housing perspective, are solving it through a rental uh, solution. I, again, I'm not sure it will work because also of our uh, culture in Egypt. You know, people are more likely to get their own houses than resort to renting uh, processes, and especially if it's if if, if the renting is with the government. So uh, there could be other solutions. We're discussing with the government now, with the Ministry of, of Housing, uh, and hopefully we will, we will be able to have a partnership soon to address the issue a bit more in depth. Thank you, thank you. If there is anything more from the floor, because before we move on, I want to ask the panelists if there's anything you would like to add. As a conclusion, well, I think I'm I'm really grateful that we've opened our session the next three days on a conversation on climate change and housing. There's so much work to be done in this space, and I think we have the people in this room that are thinking creatively about those solutions. So, thinking through really combining mitigation and adaptation efforts in ways that are contextually appropriate, working together to find creative solutions is really the way forward. So I hope to see this conversation continue through the next three days. So thank Hopefully you. All of us will be in it. Uh, Dr. Uh, Laila? Uh, I'm encouraged by what has happened at COP and going forward. Uh, I even heard the IFC people say that they want to give more grants 
to finance housing. And I never heard them say that before. But here's the complexity that we need to work on. Financing organizations, whether it's multilateral banks or banks, commercial, uh, they need investment ready projects. That, that term is a bit tricky because investment ready projects mean you've gone down to the community and asked them what they need, which bank or IFC is gonna do that. Translate that into a plan. Where are the urban planners who learn, who know how to listen to people and translate into, and then money and then land and then all of the permitting. It's a journey. So I'm looking forward to being alive <laughs> when that happens. Who know how to listen and, and to underline that. <laughs> Please go ahead. Okay, uh, just a couple of, I, I want to, to, uh, to uh, conclude with, um, let, let us focus on what will make us more uh, responding to building resilience, especially of the most vulnerable. Few principles that we have to focus on. The issue of the uh, just transition. Let's also help uh, people to uh, transfer the and help those who who used to work in in uh, in uh, uh, negatively related to the climate work uh, practices and market to uh, transfer to a clean more clean uh, jobs and uh, and relate to clean uh, and more uh, relate more to climate resilience. Uh, job opportunity. The issue of incorporated the community-based adaptation into city planning and in development planning in general. Um, when we talk about development planning, it is very important that we focus on resilience to not only development in terms of poverty issues, uh, uh, you know, uh, job creation, but let's look into adaptation and building resilience. Uh, the the issue the partnership is very important. How to bring people and government to work with the private sector, with the local communities, philanthropists, uh, philanthropists, uh, NGOs to work together be because this is an issue that cannot be dealt with governments alone. We have one from the floor before we go to Noah. Please the mic. صباح الخير أنا مجد علي حضرتك أنا بتفق مع دكتورة رانيا في حاجة إن في ناس بيبقوا هم عايزين مكان تبع مكان سكنهم مكان شغلهم مكان سكن بس أنا بعرف ناس تانية والمفروض دي تعمل ساعة استلام كراس الشروط يتقدم بيان عن وضعه المادي وضعه الاجتماعي وشغلته إيه لأن في ناس كتير بتاخد أراضي وشقق ما لهاش حقية فيها وبتاخدها كبزنس انها بتبيع الشقق بتبيع الشقق طبعا بتستنى وبتاخد عليها اوفر اوكي نفس الموضوع في الاراضي انا انا في ناس قريبه مني طلع لها شقه في القرعه اوكي تبع الاسكان والتعمير وطلع لها بعد كده ارض وباعت الشقه وباعت الارض وكانوا المفروض هم بيقولوا في كراس الشروط ان اللي بيبيع اللي بيبيع حاجه واخدها من الاسكان الاجتماعي بتتسحب منه بتروح لناس تانية هي يعني حق بيها فما حصلش كده مع ناس كتير جدا في ابن بيتك وفي في الشروق برضو في حاجة زي كده برضو مش فاكرة المكان اللي كان معمول برضو في حاجة زي كده ناس كتير أجروا ناس كتير باعوا وخدوا أوفر جامد جدا وما ما لهمش الأحقية أوكي فأنا بتفق مع دكتورة رانيا إن في ناس ما لهمش أحقية في في شقة وبياخدوها وبيستثمروها. Thank you. That's a very local matter See? she mentioned, but it's very important as well. She says when they give these homes for the poor, they should be very careful on the choices. They have to make sure that they are really poor and deserve it because she knows of people who have been given homes and they've sold them and just made money out of it. So again, the rules have to be more stringent while you're giving out homes. Finally, last but not least, Dr. Noah, your conclusive remarks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, I will end up my remarks uh, reflecting on uh, Dr. Laila's point about investment-ready projects and also going back into the key takeaways from the co-op and the pledges that has been made for financing climate adaptation. And here I just want to say that, that uh, there are two very important elements to be considered if we really want these investments to go into uh, just and affordable and accessible housing. Uh, 
The first one is that we need to understand what we call the underlying, I would say, challenges and limitations for maximizing the use of those investments at the city level in terms of the capacities, in terms of the public debts that cities already have and high inflation rates. So, uh, and also considering that those solutions or financial investments uh, that are being provided does not fit all, all uh, contexts. The second, and I think the very important element is the element of data. We need to integrate climate resilience consideration, whether it's physical or transition climate risks into financial decision making for housing financing. And this is critical if we really want to tackle this gap of, of having just climate, because justice is about knowing who is really in need and who has the priority for with the support from the most vulnerable communities. And I think that goes in, back to the point of the very last question that has been raised from the floor. So to understand really the most vulnerable and the most affected by climate impacts, we need to have the right data. And this is something that is actually available out there by several, I would say, uh, initiatives and platforms. And one of them is what we call the Carbon Disclosure Project that we as ECLA work closely on supporting cities, uh, systems, investors, and companies in reporting their uh, climate data. So with that, I would just end up by, by also opening the call for cities from the MENA region, because uh, us as ECLA European Secretariat, we do not only, uh, our network does, is not limited only for European cities. It's also open for cities from the MENA region. We have Amman as one of our member cities. So we'd love to open the call for other cities from MENA, as we also sit at the uh, MCR 2030, the Making Cities Resilient co-chair uh, for uh, the uh, MENA, uh, sorry, for, the, for Europe and Central Asia. The call is open for all cities to join so we can support them with our initiative and with our innovative solution that can open this, I would say, cross-collaborative exchange between Europe and MENA. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mirhan. I'd like to thank you all. It's time, I think, we're off. Go ahead, please.